الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our topic for today it's early morning and some of us may not be that awake. Personally, I'm not that awake either. <laughs> I woke up this last night at 2 a.m. due to jet lag and I haven't slept since, alhamdulillah. So if I do make mistakes or if I fall asleep, do yani, give me credit for the age and for the long distance I come through. Our topic is very important. See, yesterday we spoke about Allah's right. And if we analyze the Muslim world as a whole, we will find that due to the fact that we did not give Allah Azza wa Jal His right in complying with worshipping as He instructed and avoiding shirk, we see what is happening in the world as a result. So whenever we tend to neglect the rights of others, most importantly Allah Azza wa Jal, of course, we see the consequences in our lives, in our presence. Today we will talk about the rights of those whom Allah had given them authority over us. And one, in a de democratic era, as they say, we live in an age of democracy, mashaAllah, tabarakallah. And personal opinion of mine, democracy goes against Islam. If you vote whether wine is okay to be drunk or not, this is kufr. If you say yes or this is kufr, you cannot participate in implementing other than Allah's rule. You're not a Muslim. So with all yani, the talk about democracy, this is not the time. But because we live in an era of such deviancy, people would think, why do we have people of authority controlling us? See, it's not a matter of control. Life as set and created by Allah Azza wa Jal must have this type of levels. You have to have someone in authority and someone following. Otherwise, if we travel by plane for Umrah to Mecca, to Saudi Arabia, in the middle of the flight, you cannot go to the captain and say, I'd like to take my responsibility for the rest of the way. Not even his co-pilot can say that. The captain of the ship, the captain of the airplane is one. In the airplane, he's always on the left seat. Even if they had two or three captains on board, only one can be captain. So Allah Azza wa Jal created this world to be as such. A wife must obey her husband. A rule of life. A religious commitment and an obligation. A son must obey his father. He cannot say, well, you're a man and I'm a man. You don't have the right to order me and I don't have the obligation to obey you. And we have people of authority. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal created us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and have raised some of them above others in degree of rank that they may make use of one another for service. Allah created rich, not me, any people. Allah created rich and poor. 
Allah created those who need money but have a skill and those who have money and need that skill. Allah pay, uh, created people who borrow and people who lend. This is the way that Allah created people so that we can use one another. Imagine if all of us here were millionaires. Who would fix your car? Nobody. I don't need to fix your car. I don't need to slaughter a sheep and sell you the meat. I don't need to do this. So Allah created us in this fashion. Now, having said that, Allah Azza wa Jal stated in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ati'u Allah, wa ati'u al-rasul, wa ulil amri minkum. O you who have believed, obey Allah. This was our topic yesterday. How to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And who was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, and obey the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those in authority among you. Wow. So if Allah mentioned those in authority among us with him and with his messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, this means that they have a very important role in the community, in the society, in this life. So they have obligations upon us and they have rights. So who are they to begin with? The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when they gave tafsir of this ayah, they were split into two parties. Some say they are the scholars. And others say, no, they are the rulers and leaders. And Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on his soul, when he looked at all of these interpretations, he said, they are both. So the people of authority are divided into two types, scholars of religion and the rulers and leaders. Why? The scholars show us what Islam is, show us what is halal and what is haram, set the rulings that they've inherited from the Prophet والسلام, who himself had said, the scholars of religion are the heirs of the prophets. The prophets did not leave money behind. They left knowledge. And the scholars are those heirs of the prophets and messengers of Allah Azza wa So the scholars preserve the deen. They convey the message. But this is not sufficient. There has to be someone who implements it and makes sure that this is audited and that this is practiced and this is enforced. And this cannot be done except by the rulers and the leaders. So the collaboration means the perfection of this religion in our nation, in our ummah as a whole. If there is an error, then there is a, a problem. These people of authority the masses of Muslims must follow them. And if the masses of the Muslims follow these people of authority, then they will prosper. The moment there is an error, the moment there is a split, you will see what you see at the moment. If you would like to classify the state of the Muslims worldwide out of 10, how much would you give it? One to be the lowest, ten to be the highest. Would it increase three? Would it go beyond three? Maybe four to be optimistic? But it can't be. Why is this? We have the best book. The ultimate and the final revelation that will remain till the end of time. The Prophet ﷺ, the best of messengers was sent to us. So what is wrong? What is wrong is that we have seen the split between the people of authority. We've seen that the scholars of Islam have been sided. They're taking away from the full and big picture. So they don't have a say. They don't give consultation. 
and if they give consultation, no one listens to it. And this is a sign of the signs of the Day of Judgment, meaning that the Day of Judgment is appro approaching. Why? A nomad, a Bedouin, came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O Prophet of Allah, when is the hour, when is the Day of Judgment? So the Prophet said, ﷺ, said, when trusts are neglected, then await for the hour. The trust, I trust you. I entrust you. I give you responsibilities to carry. This is trust. If there is no trust between a seller and a buyer, people would steal one another. So the Prophet says, if the trust, if, uh, uh, or when trusts are neglected, then await the hour. So the man said, O Prophet of Allah, how would they be neglected? This trust, how can it be neglected? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, when positions of authority are given to the people who are not qualified for them, then await for the hour. What type of management did the Prophet have, alayhi salatu wasalam? Putting the wrong man in the wrong place. This is our calamity worldwide. Always find this in private sector, find it in companies, in governments, in everywhere. The wrong man in the wrong place. And this is a sign of the day of judgment. And therefore, when you have this split, when the real scholars are being cited and put on the side, what will happen? False scholars would come, like myself. And this is unfortunate. When you waste your time listening to the likes of me, seriously. But this is not that important. Let me finish the, uh, the, the, the lecture and then we can talk, inshallah, about this. The Muslim nation, the Ummah of Islam, this is our problem. The Prophet said, والسلام, Allah does not extract knowledge by taking it from the, from the chests of men. Allah doesn't take knowledge this way. Then how does Allah take knowledge? Allah takes knowledge by having the real scholars die. And when they die, the people will take scholars who have no knowledge, who would give fatwa, go astray and lead people astray. And this is problematic. This is exactly what happened at the beginning of time, at the time of Nuh, peace be upon him. They had five righteous scholars. When they died, shaitan came to them and said, why don't we build monuments and statues over their graves? So whenever we see them, we start to worship Allah and remember them. A generation passed. What happened? The second generation came. They did not know of this noble cause as they thought. And they looked at these five statues over the graves and said, hmm, our forefathers, why did they build it? Most likely so that they can get rain through them. So they started worshipping them. This what happens when you don't have scholars, real scholars, who would guide the ummah to know their Lord, who would guide the ummah to know what is halal and what is haram. Now, in so many Muslim countries, I'm talking about mine and others. Alhamdulillah, here maybe it's different. And may Allah preserve this country and the scholars of this country and the rulers of this country. In, my, in countries that I know of, scholars are made fun of. The media takes the scholars and make them look like clowns, like fools. So they want to draw a picture of me. They make my uh, uh, beard like uh, um, uh, anything that is funny. You know, from the Disney character, huh? Maybe. You never know. They make the scholar look so repulsive, so ugly. So when you look at this, you make fun out of him. So 
in most countries, when you talk about scholars, the first thing that comes to mind is that Imam who comes and reads Quran in funerals. And then we give him whatever is possible and he goes. A beggar who knows how to read the Quran. This is the scholars they know of. The funny thing that all countries of Islam, they talk about women's right, human's right, even animal's right. But you never find them talking about scholars' right. And whenever the ummah does not respect the sco their scholars of Islam, know that they do not respect Islam as a whole. So let us look into some of the characteristics of the scholars. How would I know a scholar? Does he wear a tag? Scholar. No, because we can buy 10 for a ringgit. And that, that doesn't make us a scholar. Scholars of Islam must be well-versed, strongly founded and established in the sciences of Islam. So they won. First of all, they have to master Arabic. You can't be a scholar in Islam when you don't know Arabic. Few words in Arabic doesn't suffice. You have to be fluent in Arabic. You have to know the Quran. Memorizing the Quran is a plus, but knowing the Quran, understanding the tafsir, knowing the abrogated from what was not abrogated is essential. The sciences of the Quran, why was it revealed? When was it revealed? It is important. He has to know the hadith of the Prophet Is it authentic? Not authentic? Was it abrogated? What's the meaning of it? When was it said? He has to know the fundamentals of fiqh. And it's a separate huge science that has so many branches under it. Then he has to understand the fiqh itself, which tells him this is halal, this is haram, this is the way a ibadah is done, a transaction is, is right or wrong, and so on. So they have to be like this in order to be real scholars. They have to be people of righteousness, piety, fear of Allah. Can a scholar be seen in an inappropriate place, doing an inappropriate act, behaving in an inappropriate way? He's not a scholar. A real scholar is a man of piety. He fears Allah. Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily, among Allah's servants, only the scholars of religion fear Allah. The true fear of Allah only is found with those who have knowledge of Allah the Almighty. They are recognized by other scholars. So if Tom, Dick or Harry come and say, I'm a scholar of Islam, who knows you? Nobody, but I know myself. So all of us are scholars, alhamdulillah, no. A scholar has to be recognized by other scholars in other countries. Yes, we know this brother. We've read his books. We've seen his lectures. We've talked to him. He is a scholar. So this is quite important also. Scholars have great value at the side of Allah. And if you read the Quran and read, and read the Sunnah, you will find so high emphasis on the status of scholars in Islam. To the degree that the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, the virtue and the level of a scholar over a, 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 a worshiper is like the difference between my level and yours. The level of the Prophet, alayhi and the rest of the ummah. So the scholar is way high, and Allah Azza wa has combined the scholars with him and with his angels. When Allah says, Allah testifies that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except him. And the angels testify and those, the scholars or those who possess the knowledge of Islam. So it has a great status at the side of Allah. Scholars are wise. And their wisdom benefits the whole ummah. Because whenever there is a calamity that is about to fall the Muslim Ummah they can see it ahead of time 
The scholars know what is right and what is wrong by judging the consequences. The masses don't. Six years ago, when there was this Arabian Spring in the Middle East, the scholars stood and said, don't do this. This is wrong. You will end up killing your people. You will end up causing chaos. You will make the Muslims hate Islam. Do not do this. Do not rebel. Call people to Islam. Call people to the practice of the Quran and the Sunnah. But don't go against the ruler. This is not the right thing. Nobody listened. And they said that you scholars don't know anything except monthly period, menses, and postnatal bleeding. This is your knowledge. Speaking this in Tahara. But when it comes to mega issues, no, no, no. This is not your piece of cake. Now, after six years, we've seen the autumn, the Arabian autumn, and then the summer, and we're entering the inferno. Why? Because they did not adhere and listen to what the scholars had to say. Okay, there are rights for such scholars. What are their rights? And mind you, the topic is so huge, but we have to minimize it and to try and benefit as much as possible. Because if we cannot cover the whole topic, then we would try to cover as much and learn and implement. The first right of the scholars is that we have to support them, love them, and be their allies. Righteous, practicing, knowledgeable scholars, we have to back them up. It is their right to, we stand by them. Because by doing so, we're standing by the Quran and the Sunnah that they represent. When you fail to do this, you fail the Quran and the Sunnah. And always remember, we are talking about the true scholars who follow the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of our righteous predecessors. Not any scholar who wears a kufi or wears a turban or wears a special dress. He becomes a scholar that I have to follow. No. We judge scholars by their compliance, by their complete, unquestionable following of the Quran and the Sunnah as the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Secondly, we have to respect them. So a scholar has to be respected. And what do we mean by respecting them? Kissing their hands and feet? This is not respect. Respecting them is to give them their due right. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I spent two years hesitant to ask Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, about a hadith because I was fearful of him out of respect. This is the respect we want with our scholars, not to find a scholar and when you see him, Sheikh, high five. What is this? Where, where are you coming from? Yeah, Sheikh is my homie. He's my buddy. Yeah, Sheikh, I love you. This is not respectful. You have to know how to address the Sheikh. You have to know how to talk to the, sheikh, to the scholar. Let me rephrase that. To the alim, the man of authority. And we see nowadays in worldwide, almost, the lack of respect to the scholar. To the, to the, to the extent that in so many countries, there are means of stopping a scholar from giving a lecture or from giving a dars. And who's responsible for this? Another scholar? No, a paper pusher. An employee maybe who has done only his fifth grade and knows how to write and sign. He says, no, 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 this sheikh is not allowed to speak. This sheikh, yes, give him. This is wrong. Such scholars must be respected. At least you want to prevent these lectures and these durus from taking place, it should be from another scholar. Among the rights of a scholar that you must carry his knowledge and spread it. 
The best thing you can do for a scholar is to take from his knowledge and spread it, share it, because this is what they thrive for. They are the keepers of the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the, heir, the heirs of the Prophet ﷺ. So whenever they teach and they see what they had taught spreading all over the world, this is the biggest joy that they might have. You have to know that disrespecting them, harming them, slandering them, is devastating for the Muslim Ummah. You have to defend them whenever they're attacked unjustly. If they were attacked fairly, make excuses, but don't defend them blindly. Following them blindly is not part of Islam because they are not infallible. They are human beings, they may have mistakes, but you have to defend them whenever someone talks about Sheikh so-and-so or Imam so-and-so unjustly, unfairly, you have to stand and defend. Because they are the one who convey and relay the knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah to us. Among their rights that you must observe what comes out of your mouth against them. I sit with students of knowledge I sit with common people, and whenever a topic comes, they speak ill about scholars. Not that they are bad or good. They say, no, no, this fatwa is wrong. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And who are you? What knowledge do you have? So I don't have to have knowledge. I know that this is wrong. W w w where is this coming from? Can you quote an ayah? Can you quote a hadith? He said, no, but Sheikh so-and-so said it was wrong. Oh, okay, then this is the case. So my sheikh against your sheikh, whose biceps is bigger? <laughs> this is how we measure knowledge? This is how we measure things in Islam? Yeah, yeah, but we have like 10 scholars with me. He has only nine. It's not a tug of war. This is knowledge. This is Quran and Sunnah. So you cannot say that this scholar is wrong or this scholar is right out of thin air because... You're not qualified. You're not qualified to go to a neurosurgeon and say to him, I think that procedure you're going to follow doing my operation in my mind is wrong. You should change it. Akhi, you don't have a mind to begin with if you go and speak with the doctor like this. Part of the rights of the scholars, knowing that they're not ma'asum, uh, um, they're not infallible they're bound to make mistakes once they make a mistake you should not tarnish their reputation and you should not make them scum of the world because a single mistake they had this is wrong measure the good that came to humanity throughout the, these past years or decades you will find it immense now, if they make a mistake or two, this is part of their human nature. So you do not accept their mistakes, but you do not simply cross them out. There are so many people now, when you say, uh, what do you think of Dr. So-and-so? Oh, no, he has this mistake and that mistake. Yeah, but 100,000 people embraced Islam because of him. What do you think of Sheikh So-and-so? Oh, he doesn't believe that this thing is haram. Or he says that you have to do this thing. So we don't listen. At the end of the day, you have no one to listen to. This is not the right way of doing it. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu salam, when one scholar or a ruler makes ishtihad and he's correct, Allah rewards him twice. And if he makes his effort and, and strives to do the best, but makes an error, Allah would reward him once. So in both cases, they're rewarded. But you sitting back and criticizing like this, this is not the right thing to do. And finally, not for the lecture, for the scholars' rights. Listen, we have, mashallah, more and more. Uh, finally, their biggest right, or one of their biggest right, is that we have to always 
cross-check with them. You have to surround the scholars and nag them and bug them with questions in your life. Because my knowledge and yours is not as good. In so many times we make mistakes in judgment, especially in times of calamities. So when there is a calamity, when there is tribulation, when there is chaos and mishap, you don't make your decision on your own. Go to the scholars, ask them, what do you think I should do? Do you think that this is the right course to be followed or not? Why? Because Allah ordered you to do this. Where did Allah order me to do this, Shaykh? I don't, I've read the Quran twice in my life. I've never passed by something like this. Is it enough to read the Quran twice in your life? Akhi, the least, the minimum requirement for a real Muslim to recite the Quran is once every month. In Ramadan, of course, it's about five times, ten times, depending. So at least every year you should recite the whole Quran, read it, not less than 15 times. And if you are 40 years of age and you have not completed the Quran except once or twice in your life, what are you doing? You're wasting your time sitting here, seriously. Read Allah's book. This is our constitution. This is our salvation, the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, and when there comes to them information about public security or fear, they spread it around. This is what's happening. Whenever we hear something, we spread it around. Regardless, it's true or not. Regardless, we understand the implication of it or not. Allah says, but if they had referred it back to the messenger of Allah or to those of authority, listen, if they referred it to the messenger or to those of authority among them, then the ones who can draw correct conclusion, those are the scholars, the one who can draw correct conclusions from it would have known about it. So you must surround the scholars around you. You must consult them. You must all the time seek guidance from them because they know what you do not know and they possess the Quran, the knowledge of the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Now, we finish the easy part. Let's go to the serious one. The people of authority who are the rulers, who are the leaders, the kings, the presidents, the ministers. Oh, I wish I had a machine gun <laughs> to kill the enemies of Islam and protect them. So now it's flipped it, huh? Mashallah, very diplomatic. Very, no, no, seriously. The, the large population of the Muslims have mixed feelings in their hearts when it comes to rulers. You find some loving them more than the messengers and the prophets. Whatever they say is right. And you find others who think that they are hypocrites, kafir, jinn, shaitan with black magic. So I'm a Muslim. I need to know, I need to understand my religion. When Allah tells me to, be, to obey those of authority among us, how should I perceive them? How should I deal with them? Life cannot go on without a ruler. This is a fact of life. The scholars of past times of a Salaf used to say, one day under the ruling of an unfair and unjust ruler, one day is better than 70 years without a ruler. But he's unfair, he's unjust. Yes, but life does not go, does not move without this ruler. And this is why Allah ordered us to obey them. Oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messengers of, uh, messenger of Allah and those of authority among you. But why should I obey them? This is Allah's law. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, adhir, and obey even if 
an Abyssinian slave was appointed to rule you. The Arabs at the time used to have slaves. They may free them and they may keep them. Among the best of those who were freed, Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him. Umar used to say, this is Sayyiduna to Abu Bakr and he freed Sayyidana to Bilal. Umar used to consider Bilal to be his Sayyid, his master. So Islam came to abolish anything about slavery, about color. There is no preference for color, Abyssinian or non-Abyssinian. He was appointed as a ruler. You must obey him. But this obedience is restricted to obeying Allah Azza wa Jal. So if the ruler tells me when the light is red, you have to stop. Where is it in the Quran? Where is it in the Sunnah? I don't find it, so I will not listen to you. I'm going to drive. He dies, he kills five, he goes to jail, Allah will punish him. Allah ordered you to obey as long as there is no sin in it. Did he order you to sin? No, then you have to obey. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, obedience and adherence, there is listening and obeying is a must upon each and every single Muslim individual, whether he loves it or hates it. As long as he's not instructed to sin. If he's instructed to sin, then there is no adherence and there is no obedience. If my ruler comes and says, you have to skip Fajr prayer. I'm not going to skip Fajr prayer. This is a sin. If he comes and says, don't give zakat, I'm not going to obey him. If he says, you have to drink uh, uh, wine, or you have to gamble, or you have... No, these things I must not do, even if he orders me to do. But this doesn't mean that I have to disobey him in everything else. At the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, the Prophet dispatched an expedition, and he appointed an Amir, a ruler, a leader, and he told them, obey him. So the man was with them in the expedition, and one night he went to the canteen where they cooked the food, and he asked the man for extra food, the one who's responsible in spreading the rationing. And the man said, no, you took your share. He took my share, huh? Okay. He asked his fellow men to gather fire for the uh, wood for the fire so they did he ordered them to lit it so the big flames and light was there he said the prophet said والسلام, you must obey me correct he said yes he said okay throw yourself in, in hell the companions started they were confused throw ourselves in hell we're running away from hell by accepting islam and he wants us to to, to throw ourselves in the fire what is this and the others said but the prophet ordered us to obey him Mm, so he said, no, no, we're not going to do this. And they continued in their expedition. When they came back, the Prophet ﷺ told them, had you obeyed him, you would never had left it. You would never had gone out of it because you disobeyed Allah by obeying him. But he did not order them to disobey him in everything else. So the haram, you disobey. Everything else remains as it is. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever obeys Allah, whoever obeys me, the messenger, has obeyed Allah. And whoever disobeys me, he has disobeyed Allah. Because the Prophet is a messenger. He doesn't speak from his own. It's all wahi, revelation. Then he said, and whoever obeys the ruler, he has obeyed me. And whoever disobeys his ruler, he has disobeyed me. And nowadays, people obey the ruler when there is benefit for them. So if the ruler gives them money, if the taxes are low, though taxation in Islam is haram, but let's assume that he makes it low, he gives them benefits, he gives them things that they are satisfied with, they will obey him. But if he doesn't, they will find it easy to disobey. The Prophet said, والسلام, on the day of judgment, and the hadith is agreed upon by Bukhari and Muslim, 
Three, Allah will not speak to them, will not look at them, will not purify them, and will put them in uh, 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 torment and punishment of the fire. Who are they? One of them, the Prophet said, والسلام, a man gave his pledge of allegiance to his ruler. He doesn't do this except for this world. He's not doing it for the sake of Allah. If the ruler gives him what he wants, he will submit and obey. But if he doesn't, he will not submit and will not obey. This person, Allah will not talk to him on the day of judgment, neither look at him nor purify him, and he will give him a, a strong torment and punishment. Now, when we talk about leaders, anyone who's appointed upon you and has control and authority over you is a leader, whether he is the great imam. Long ago, inshallah, Allah will bring this time back again. The Muslim ummah had one imam, the khalifa. But now, countries are divided. So each country, the ruler is the imam. That they must obey, as long as he's Muslim. And those whom he appoints, ministers and, and chief of police, and etc., they are people of authority that must be obeyed as well. And by saying obeying, this doesn't mean that we have to keep our mouth shut when we see something wrong. If we see our ruler doing something wrong, we have to speak out and give advice with the Islamic etiquettes. The Prophet said, والسلام, you will have rulers ruling you. And you will see things that you recognize and approve of and things that are evil and haram and you disapprove of. So whoever hates it internally, he's okay. And whoever speaks against it, then he is safe. But the problem is with those who are in content and do not speak at all. They are in great danger. So as long as you speak out with the Islamic etiquette to bring the matter to the ruler's attention, then you are safe, inshallah, and there's no sin on you. So, in less than 10 minutes, this screen is too big for the time. Yeah, it makes me feel handicapped. But alhamdulillah. So, what are the rights of the rulers and leaders? There are so many of them. I selected few for you. One, you have to admit of their authority over you and you have to have the conviction in obeying them whenever it is bil ma'roof there is no sin in it and you have to stand by them in defending the truth the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said in a long hadith he said after me there will come rulers and leaders who do not follow my sunnah and they do not rule in my way and there will come men with the hearts of devils and the bodies of humans Hudayfa said O oh Prophet of Allah if this time comes and I'm there what should I do the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam said to him you must obey and you must adhere to the ruler even if he flogs your back and takes your money. Now, question marks. A lot of the people, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to take my guns and cannons and make a rebellion. And do. Akhi, you're a Muslim. This is Allah's instruction to you. This is the Prophet's direction to you. Now, why would I do such a thing? My ruler is unfair. He's unjust. He's taking all the money, depositing uh, deposit, can you edit this, please? <laughs> Depositing it in Swiss banks. So why should I obey him? He's causing me trouble. Because if you don't, you're one in a hundred million. If you don't obey him, the hundred million will be affected. If you obey him, Allah will store it for you in Jannah. And we will, he will throw him in hell. But 
life will go on for the rest of the 100 million or the 10 million or the 1 million. It is for the bigger or for the greater good of the Muslims. And this is how things go. It's not what you like. It is what Allah wants you to do. Now, you have to direct them. You have to show them what is right and what is wrong. Because this is part of their rights upon us. And it's an obligation from us to them. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, ad-deenun nasiha, which translates to religion or the deen is advice and sincerity. So the companion said, advice and sincerity to whom? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, and to the leaders of the Muslims and their common folk. So we must give them advice. But maybe they will not listen. This is not your responsibility. All what you have to do is convey the message. And Allah Azza wa Jal, when he wills it, they will adhere to it. Among their rights is when they appoint us to do something, we have to comply. They ordered us, they order us to do something. The Prophet told us to comply. We have to adhere and we have to obey. We have to do this with total honesty. No cheating, no betrayals. The Prophet said, والسلام, give back what you were entrusted with and ask Allah for what is yours. A man borrows from me 10,000 and he has something deposited with me. He comes and claims what he deposited, a watch, a car. So I say to him, give me my 10,000. He said, you have no proof. Show me your proof that I took from you 10,000. Show me your witnesses. So I said, in this case, I will keep the car. <clears throat> the prophet said, no, you have to give what you were entrusted with. This is an obligation. Okay, what about my money? Your money, you will take it from Allah Azza wa on the day of judgment. You have to bring it to their attention that this is wrong. This is munkar. This is haram. What rulings you are about to take goes against Islam. But you don't do this on the newspapers or on live TV. You don't do this in rallies in public like some countries do. They come and make rallies and they curse the ruler, they curse the ministers and they make them look like uh, uh, kids and, and children that they play with publicly. But yeah, this is fun. This is fun, Sheikh. We, li we like this when we hear them talk about our rulers and leaders. It's fun. No, it's not fun. It's haram. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Whoever wants to give advice to a ruler, he must not do it publicly. This is the Prophet's words, alayhi salatu wasalam, his teachings, if you're a Muslim. Do not do it publicly. Rather, he should take his hand and be alone with him. Of course, after they frisk him, that he doesn't have any poisons or guns. Otherwise, <laughs> so he has to take his hands, talk in private with him, if he accepts, alhamdulillah. And if he doesn't, then you have done your duty in front of Allah. Never do it publicly. In Bukhari and Muslim, Usama ibn Zayd, may Allah be pleased with him. A group of people came and said to him, complaining about Uthman ibn Affan, the third caliph, one of the ten heaven bound. Yani, the one who married two of the Prophet's sister, uh, uh, Prophet's daughters, alayhi salatu wasalam, Umm Kalthum and Ruqayya. So they're telling him, why don't you go and complain to Uthman about the wrong things that we think that he's doing? And he wasn't doing any wrong things. He's a righteous Khalifa. But the masses don't know what's behind the curtains. They don't know why he took such judgments. So they went to Osama ibn Zayd, ibn Haritha, to complain. And Osama ibn Zayd looked at them and said, do you think that every time 
I go and give advice to Uthman, I'm going to come and tell you? Are you crazy? I advise him between him and me, and no one else is with us so that I would not open a gate for fitna to come in. If Islam ibn Zayd speaks publicly, then all the others would stand up and speak publicly, and what will happen? Chaos. What did happen to Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him? He was besieged and surrounded in his home for so many days without food and water. He's the third caliph, the righteous, guided, heaven, heaven bound. And then they executed him and assassinated him in his house while reading the Quran. 84 years of age. May Allah be pleased with him. Why? Because of this chaos, mishap, a lot of tribulations and calamities. You have to try and gather the ummah to love them, even if you don't love them. And most likely, a lot of the Muslims don't love them, unfortunately. But nevertheless, you have to try your level best to have the hearts to them of the Muslims and to gather around them. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever takes his hand away from the allegiance to his imam, he will meet Allah on the day of judgment without any justification or reasoning. Whoever takes his hand away. So I gave my pledge of allegiance to my imam, but then after a while I said, I will not obey him, I will not listen to him. And whoever dies, the Prophet says, السلام, without the pledge of allegiance to an imam, to a ruler, to a leader, then he will die the death of jahiliyyah, of the pre-Islam era. Now all of you have a pledge of allegiance. I have a pledge of allegiance. People of Kuwait have pledge of allegiance to their rulers. But there are people who live in a country and say, we don't have any pledge of allegiance. We don't approve of our, ru our, our ruler. We don't look at him as so and so. And this is very problematic. Because this takes you away from Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah into the Khawarij who do not have a ruler of their own and they give takfir. And this is an, another issue. Part of their rights is that you should notify them if they have done anything unjust. So they would restore justice to its people by advising them in secret, by channels that you can reach them. Also, and finally, part of their rights is that you do not flatter them or praise them or kiss their boots. Their boots. A lot of people kiss their boots in order for some money because this is cheating. You have to Call a spade a spade. When you come to an unfair, an unjust ruler who doesn't fear Allah, and you say, MashaAllah, I know this man, he prays night prayer. What night prayer? You're lying. You, when you praise the ruler or the minister, or, and you say you are among the most righteous, you are the most truthful, you are the most kind, you are the most generous, just to score a point with him. That may help you if you want to admit your son into university next year. This is haram. This is betraying them. You have to be fair and just, respecting them, but not falsely praising them. Respect is important and essential in Islam. The Prophet said, والسلام, whoever honors the ruler of Allah in this life, Allah will honor him on the day of judgment. And whoever insults or humiliates the ruler of Allah in this earth, Allah will insult him on the day of judgment. It says time is up. But I have a very important um, last point. When is uh, Mufti's uh, lecture? What time? 11. We have half an hour, inshallah. Anyhow, all over the Muslim world, we have revolutions. 
we have rebellions. We have people taking up arms to go against the unfair and unjust Muslim ruler. Is this halal or haram? See, as Muslims, we have to analyze this with our Quran and Sunnah, not with our minds or with our feelings. Because if it were to our feelings, we would use that machine gun and cannon and blow everybody else. But what is the Islamic rule? The Prophet والسلام, in the hadith of Ubad ibn al-Samit, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you have to obey and adhere when you are uh, enthusiastic or not, when you are at ease or at hardship, and that you must not dispute with whom Allah has appointed them upon you as rulers unless you see blatant kufr, you have evidence from Allah to support it. These are four difficult conditions set by the Prophet ﷺ that you cannot fight the rulers and re have a, a, a rebellion or to overthrow them unless you have these four conditions to prove that they are disbelievers. So if I have a Muslim ruler who is a Muslim but sinful, can I do this? No, you cannot do. Sheikh, he drinks wine. You cannot do this. Sheikh, he steals money from the treasury. You cannot do this. Sheikh, he does this and he does that. You cannot do this. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, unless they made a blatant show of kufr and you have evidence from Allah that they are doing is indeed kufr. In another hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, talk to his companions, warning them of what to come after his death. And that you will find that there are rulers that will change a lot of my sunnah. So the companions were hot-blooded Muslims. So I said, oh Prophet of Allah, shouldn't we take up arms against them? Shouldn't we fight them? What did the Prophet say, alayhi No, as long as they pray. That's all. They pray with you in the masjid. You see them in the Jum'ah. They're Muslims. Halas. And this means that the majority of rebellions and revolutions and throwing governments in the Muslim world are against Islam. And if you look at the consequence of what's happening, the devastation that, and the suffering that the Muslims are suffering because of that, you understand that the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ is the best in the world. He told this, this to us 15 centuries ago, and we can see that it fits like a glove. Now, it is not permissible to rebel against the rulers for sinful things. This is totally prohibited. This doesn't mean that you accept it and turn a blind eye. As mentioned earlier, you go and talk to him. This is wrong. This is haram. But in private, if all of us, the 2000 in this beautiful hall were to do this, okay, maybe the first letter he said, no, okay, yes, inshallah, I throw it in the dustbin. Second letter, third letter, tenth letter, thousand letter, in the dustbin is, he has to bring a bigger one. It's not going to be sufficient. And this is exactly when you see something evil. When you see munkar, and you walk by it and say, and you move. You didn't do anything. If you talk to the brother, Akhi, salam alaykum, alaykum salam. Akhi, smoking is bad for you and it's a sin. May Allah Azza wa Jal repent upon you and guide you. He says, Jazakallah khair, do you have a light? <laughs> move on. He's mocking you? No problem, move on. The second one comes and says the same thing. The third one, the tenth one. After a while, the guy will look, Wallahi, this is problematic. It's not worthwhile. So many people are talking about it. No one will stay adamant on such a sin. But when we do not speak at all, it will increase. And there will be two, there will be five, there will be ten. And then you will go to Singapore and try to pick up smoking there like, 
Mufti said yesterday. So we have to try our level best to restore the rights to our scholars, to restore the rights to our rulers, and to always think positive. Things can improve if we have a positive look at life. If we keep on just criticizing, just ridiculing, making fun of the rulers, making fun of the scholars, we will never advance. We will never prosperous. We have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah in the same methodology that the Prophet and the companions, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, did. And with this, inshallah, we will prosperous as they had done. Wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi ilayhi aslam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. For those who had fallen asleep, you may wake up now. Assalamu alaikum. Ratbah jatna, anno yalla li tchubbu, li hazzat.